I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spreads the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all the stars obey. Amen. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from the book of Esther, chapter 4, verses 10 through 14. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go in to the king these 30 days. So they, to so they told Mordecai Esther's words. And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Again, I bid you a good morning and greetings from my churches in Montgomery, Alabama, where today in a congregation of about 15 to 20, we were supposed to have a pianist and three violinists if everything went according to plan. And I'll call my wife and find out. My wife has been here several times with me and she wishes she could be here this time as well. We're going to be looking at the book of Esther today, but I'm going to begin with Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verses 4 through 7. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. Build ye houses and dwell in them and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may increase there, and not be diminished. And seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall you have peace. Jeremiah here is speaking during the Babylonian captivity. He and Daniel are contemporaries. Daniel writes his prophecies from Babylon or Persia, while Jeremiah is writing from Jerusalem. And he is giving advice to those who have been taken captive, knowing that they will be captive for 70 years, that while you are captives in Babylon, seek the peace, the shalom, the welfare, of the city where you are captive. In other words, be good citizens of the city where you are. But of course, don't forget that your ultimate citizenship is in heaven. 
good advice for all who are living in a land that is not really the kingdom of God. Now, there are three books that are written of this period, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. After King Cyrus gave a decree in 538, some say 536, that the Jews could return to their homeland, many returned. Many others stayed in Persia and Babylon. Two who went back to Jerusalem were Ezra the governor and Nehemiah the wall builder. But one stayed, and that was Esther, who we know to be Esther the queen. God had a role for each of them to play. So how could this happen? We're going to see that as we look to the book of Esther today. Other times, I might be glad to talk about Ezra and about Nehemiah, but today we're going to look at Esther. And Esther is a fascinating story. In fact, if Esther were only a literary work and nothing more, it would be a masterpiece of literature. But it is much more than that. It is the Word of God. The plot is so tight. It is so intricately drawn. It will fascinate us, but it can't fascinate us to the extent that we lose the significance of its basic message. It's a story of kings, of queens, of heroes, of villains. The word Esther means star, but is Esther the real star of the story? Who is the real star? Well, I'm going to ask that question several times as we go through this book. Who was Esther? Normally, I would read Esther chapter 4, verses 10 through 16, but I'm going to save portions of that for later because that has already been read for us here. Esther is a young Jewish lady. She is living in captivity in Persia. Some of their people have gone home. Others have remained. She is raised by her older cousin, whose name is Mordecai. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, so that would tell us that she must be of the tribe of Benjamin as well. They are of the fourth generation of the captivity. In other words, their great-grandparents had been among the original captives. Mordecai seems to have been in a respected position there in Persia, as some of the Jews were. We're told that he sat in the gate, meaning that he was a judge, but not only that, that he sat in the king's gate, meaning that he was on the Supreme Court. Obviously, a very respectable man. Now, one thing we need to mention is that in Persia, women had quite high status. We don't hear a great deal about Persia today. Modern liberal historians are in love with Greece, and Persia is the enemy of Greece, and therefore they love to put down Persia and exalt Greece. But Persia has a lot of things to recommend it. Persia is quite different from many others in the area. They are an Indo-European people. Parsi, their language, is more of an Indo-European language. And their system of government was more Indo-European. They believed in a god, one god, although they also believed in a devil as well, who had equal power in their view, dualists, you might say. They also believed that their kings were appointed by God, but that although they spoke for God, they were not gods themselves. At least that was the Persian view originally. As time went on, the view changed, and they began to worship their kings as though they were gods, but not at the time we're reading about here. The king had a very remarkable wife in the name of Queen Vashti, but in chapter 1, and I'm not going to have time here today to read each of these chapters for you, but in chapter 1, we begin with King Ahasuerus, the Persian emperor, holding a six-day party for his nobles. And we read that he and his nobles are, well, the King James term is 
merry with wine, and we could think of a lot of modern terms that could be used to describe that in much more vivid detail. Meanwhile, Queen Vashti is holding a party for the wives of these noblemen. And there in the course of this drinking party, King Ahasuerus is telling the other nobles what a beautiful wife he has. And so he commands that Queen Vashti be brought into the room and so the men may see how beautiful she is. And in verse 12 of chapter one, she refuses. Now, there are some who have taken this as though she is rebellious and disobedient. I would disagree. I think she is refusing to obey an unlawful command and an utterly vile command, a command that your wife come out to be leered at by a bunch of drunk nobles. I think she had every right to refuse this. But it did put the king in a difficult position in front of his nobles, so in order to show his authority, he has to depose her as queen and banish her. Otherwise, he'll look weak before his nobles. And so Queen Vashti is banished. All of this is according to a plan. And we're going to see how all of this works out. So now in chapter 2, King Ohasuerus is holding a beauty contest to determine who is going to be the new queen. He is sobered up. He remembers his decree, and chances are he regrets it. But one of the unique feature, features of Persian law is that the king is under the law, not over it. And once the king has issued a decree, he is powerless to change it. Remember, we saw that repeatedly in the book of Daniel. No, o king, that the laws of the Medes and the Persians changeth not. He is bound by that order. So as he holds this beauty contest for his next queen, Mordecai suggests to his cousin Esther that she should enter this contest because she's a beautiful and a very accomplished woman. But he says, don't reveal that you and I are Jews. And the contest takes place. We read that the king delights in Esther, probably because he sees character in her as well as beauty. And so he makes her his queen. And throughout all of this, she is obedient to Mordecai, does not reveal that she is a Jewess and that he is a Jew. Now, we also read that right about this time, Mordecai learns of a plot to assassinate the king. And this is really one of the weaknesses in the Persian system. There is so much that I could commend about Persia, but one of the weaknesses is a poor system of succession. You know, you look to Egypt. In Egypt, you have a lot of mediocrity. But one thing about Egypt is you have stability. Egypt really hasn't won a major war in about, about 3,000 years. But they had a system. It was absolute. When a king dies, the pharaoh dies, his oldest son takes over. That's the way it was. Stability, but also that oldest son might not be that capable. And so you had a lot of mediocre pharaohs. Well, Persia is more dynamic. The next king or emperor is going to be of the royal family, but not necessarily the oldest. And the magi are going to be the ones who select the next king. And if you as one of the princes is not satisfied with who is to be the, who has been chosen, you would engage in palace intrigue. In fact, the assassinations, the instability, the struggles over the throne, well, really, only Rome in its latter days rivaled Persia for that kind of bloodshed and assassination and intrigue at the higher levels like that. But anyway, so Mordecai learns that there is a plot to assassinate the king, and he reports it through Esther. The assassins are executed. The plot is foiled. And this is all written in the king's chronicles. That's going to be significant in a little bit. But Mordecai is not rewarded 
for having discovered the plot. And that is significant as well as we're going to see. And so as we close chapter two, I'd ask, who is the real hero here? Is it Esther? Is it Mordecai? Is it King Ozuerus? Or is it somebody else? And now in chapter three, enters somebody else, and I assure you, he is not the hero. This is Haman. Haman is an Agagite, we are told, which means an Amalekite. And if you know from earlier biblical history of all of the enemies of Israel, the Amalekites were probably their fiercest enemies. And he is a prince or satrap or regional governor over Persia. And he has just been promoted to prime minister. And he's a very vain man. He expects people to bow to him as commonly they do. But when he passes this man Mordecai, Mordecai refuses to bow. After all, he is Jewish and we bow only to God. And Haman is infuriated by this. He suspects and later learns that he is right, that Mordecai is a Jew, he hates him. And therefore, he persuades King Ahasuerus to sign a decree, a decree that the Jews are going to be destroyed. Notice what he says. There is a, and this is chapter 3, verse 8. There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom, and their laws are different from all people, and that is true. They are still following the Mosaic law. Neither keep they the king's laws, and that is a lie. Therefore, it is not for the king's prophet to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed. And I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those who have charge of the business to bring it to the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, which is a way of sealing an order. And the order is published in every province. The Jews are to be destroyed. But once again, where is the hero of the story? Chapter 4 begins with Mordecai learning of Haman's order. And he and the other Jews repent of their sins in sackcloth, an outer sign of an inward repentance. Mordecai then advises Queen Esther of Haman's order. And he basically says to Esther, you're in a position to do something about this. You are in a position to tell the king that this is going on, and thereby you can save your people. And notice the exchange that was read earlier between Mordecai and Esther through their messengers. After Mordecai has given these words, we find Esther's answer in chapter 4 and verse 10. And Again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his, thank you, there is one law of his to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. This was Persian law, that no one could come before the king without the king first granting an appointment. And that even included the queen. Now the king, if somebody comes before him without an appointment, the law is that person be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter, which is a pardon. But she says, I don't know if he's going to extend it to me. He hasn't called me to be before him for 30 days. And they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Esther hears those words and she gives her answer in verse 15 and 16. 
Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer. Go, gather all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in before the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. She is going to risk her life to save her people. And that's exactly what she does. But meanwhile, something else is going on. It is interesting the way this plot is developing. There's a great banquet that is going to take place. But in the meantime, Haman has a plot not only to kill all the Jews, but particularly to get rid of this possible rival, Mordecai. And so he has built a gallows, and the gallows from Cubits is translated into about a 75-foot-high gallows to hang Mordecai from the gallows. And he is going to inform the king of that plan tomorrow, but that's when the banquet's going to take place. Meanwhile, the night before, King Ahasuerus is unable to sleep. Who do you suppose caused that? And so they bring before him the chronicles to read. I mean, if that can't put him to sleep, nothing can. And as the servants read to him from the chronicles, they read about Mordecai having revealed the assassination plot. Remember, that was in the, the chronicles. And the king asks, what honor and dignity hath been bestowed upon Mordecai for this? And they answer, well, nothing. And obviously the king is disturbed by this. So now look at how all of this comes together. The next morning, Haman comes to the king's court and he's about to be installed as the prime minister at this banquet. And so the king asks Haman, what shall be done for the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now, who's the man the king delights to honor? Well, no doubt in Haman's mind who that is. That's himself. Oh, I think he should probably be given royal apparel and a crown and let one of the other governors or princes parade before him on horseback before the crowd to make them all praise him as he passes through. That's what I think you ought to do for this man in whom you delighteth. And the king says, you're right, that's a good plan. Do that for Mordecai. What? Haman is mortified, but he knows he has to obey for now at least. So at the banquet where Haman is to be installed as prime minister, Esther is giving this banquet. And there in chapter 7, we read, here's where the plot really comes to its climax that the king tells Esther at this time, Queen Esther, make a request. I'll give you any request you ask up to half the kingdom. And Esther answers, if I have found favor in thy sight, please let my life be spared and that of my people for someone seeks to kill us. And the king is shocked. Well, my beloved queen, who would want to kill you? And she answers, the wicked Haman. Because Haman hates us. He hates me because I am a Jew. He hates my cousin Mordecai because he also is a Jew. And then Havana shows the king a, that 75-foot gallows that Haman has erected outside on which he is going to hang Haman or Mordecai the very man that <clears throat> the king desires to honor because he saved him from the assassination. And the king says, hang Haman on those gallows. And they do. Now that would sound at that point like things are anticlimactic now. This sounds like the story is now over and they all live happily ever after. But we've still got one problem. That decree that the king issued, that the Jews will be destroyed, remember the laws of the Medes and the Persians changeth not. And so the king is powerless to revoke that decree. So what does the king do? He says, I can't revoke that decree, but I'm issuing another decree. 
and that's that if anyone tries to kill the Jews, the Jews may defend themselves. And as we know from history, the Jews are pretty good at defending themselves. And so the Jews prosper in the land at this time. Mordecai is elevated to prime minister in place of Haman. Esther is the favored queen. We read in chapter 10 and verse 2, For Mordecai the Jew was next under King Ahasuerus, and great among the Jews, and accepted by the multitude of his brethren, seeking the welfare, the shalom of his people, and speaking peace, shalom, to all his seed. The Jews in Persia received great blessing through Mordecai and Esther. And many others, seeing the blessing to the Jews, are converted to Judaism as a result. But I'm asking you again, who is the real hero of the book of Esther? Is it Esther? Mordecai? King Ahasuerus? Certainly isn't Haman. Who is the real star? The real star of the story is God. And here is what is so shocking about this. Throughout the entire book of Esther, God is not even mentioned. Liberals love to point that out. This can't be the word of God. Clearly, it's not the word of God. God isn't even mentioned in it. That is the very beauty of the book of Esther. The message of Esther is that God is in the shadows, that sometimes God appears to be silent. Sometimes we pray to him, and it just seems like we're praying into the wind, and it is not heard. But God is working even when we don't see him. All throughout this book, God has been at work. God moved through Queen Vashti's refusal to obey that stupid order, thereby enabling Esther to be on the throne. He worked through Mordecai discovering the assassination plot and the plot being recorded in the Chronicles and Mordecai not being honored for it. God worked through the king not being able to sleep and having the Chronicles read to him, and learning that Mordecai had not been honored, God even moves through Haman's ego, his desire for self-glorification, and which glory through God's intervention is placed upon Mordecai and his people instead. God moves through Haman's evil plotting, causing him to be hanged on the very gallows that he had erected for Mordecai. God is at work throughout this book, even though he is not mentioned. And yes, the author of this book could so easily have mentioned God. I believe he deliberately does not mention God here because the message is that God is at work on our behalf, even when we don't see him, even when we don't hear him, even when it appears that our prayers are not being answered. And so the message for us out of the book of Esther is stand firm for God's truth, knowing that God all this time is in the shadows, that he is watching over his own. In the hymn that we're going to be singing in just a little bit, Once to Every Man and Nation, I'd ask you to think especially of the final verse of this hymn, Though the cause of evil prosper, yet to truth alone is strong. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne. Yet that scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch above his own. And I would urge you, as you stand firm for the truth of God's word, that you remember those words of Mordecai to Esther, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Thank you. <laughs>